of the things is you need to have genetic sequences for your patients. It used to cost, you know, seven figures to do a complete genetic sequence. Probably in a couple years, it would be 100 bucks. okay? So that's a huge change. There are uh, providers right now, Vanderbilt's one of them, uh, Intermountain Health in Salt Lake City is another, that are collecting tissue samples of every one of their patients and saving them because they know that they can genetically sequence that entire genome whenever they need to uh, in a couple of years for a couple hundred dollars. And that will have a huge impact on their ability to design the right pathway for that patient. Um, the other thing about that is uh, it's too much information for a clinician to be able to process, right? So you think about it the way a typical doc uh, takes care of patients and, and all the places they get information and it sort of all goes through their head and to the patient. They're, that's not going to be sustainable. You're going to have to have some kind of analytic machine that churns away on this person's profile, their genetic profile, how they responded, their age, their disease condition, all those things, and then say, hey, based on these criteria, this is the best way to take care of a patient. Right, so I mentioned Amazon before. We're all kind of familiar with the, the look and feel of that. You go there, you pick a product, and, it, and on the bottom it says, you know, the people who, who looked at this product eventually bought this. The people who bought it also bought this. We should have that in healthcare, right? If somebody checks in, we get information from them. There's some engine that turns in the background and says, okay, a person who's a 46-year-old male with this condition, with this genetic profile, responds best to this treatment pathway, right? That, that's simple. It, it should happen. Uh, the creation of that evidence is called evidence-based medicine. That's something that is driving a lot of the change. And evidence-based medicine is the, the result of comparative effectiveness studies. So you look at comparative effectiveness studies to determine what's the right pathway. You put it back at the bedside or at the point of care through uh, decision support tools and evidence-based medicine. So all this new science requires a tremendous amount of data analytics and data capability, and, and there's obviously opportunities there for huge new players and, and components. All right, we mentioned that the, the cost of, of sequencing has gone down. Uh, you can see the numbers on there, um, from $300 million down to $100. That's, that's uh, better than cell phones, right? <clears throat> Um, one of the interesting points to this is, as that first bullet on the left, we're starting to see a lot of blurring of, you, you probably heard the term nutraceuticals or, or things like that. It, it, the diff, what, what is a, a pharmaceutical and what is a, a product for beauty or, or personal care, that kind of, that kind of line is changing. Uh, and as a result of that, there's going to be more consumer-facing marketing as a result of this. And, and obviously that's... Uh, that's a big issue with privacy uh, advocates because you don't necessarily want people's profiles to be used to, to generate targeted marketing, um, but it, it's going to happen. <laughs> so the consumer electronics play, uh, basically you've got personalized medicine driving a lot of changes. It will redefine the doctor-patient relationship. You'll probably see a lot more information coming out of a system than from your doctor's mouth as a result of this. and. Uh, you know, there's going to be a need for secondary applications and product offerings. You know, the, it's going to change the way R&D happens. It's going to change the way um, patients are recruited for clinical trials. It's going to change the way that we develop uh, the cohorts for the clinical trials. Uh, Ab uh, I think it's Avon. Maybe it's um, Mary Kay. Has actually built a, uh, a cohort of like over a million women who have volunteered to be clinical trial participants in breast cancer. And so they have this database uh, which, uh, you know, they put in all this information and if somebody needs a specific set of folks for, for a clinical trial, they can go to that database. I think we'll start to see a lot more of that. <clears throat> so how can your company position itself with this market? So we got on the left, you know, our, our current state, we got volume-based payments, uh, we're going to move to performance and value-based patients, payments. So. Value-based purchasing is the term that Medicare is using for this. That means we're going to pay you if you perform well. If we're not, we're going to, re we're going to take some of that reimbursement money away. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, 80% happens outside of hospitals, but most people think of care in hospitals. We're going to definitely going to see more retail-type things and more things in the home, definitely more in the home. Uh, and there's, you know, huge opportunity for putting monitoring devices uh, 
and alerting type things within the home. And then the one size fits all, obviously, I think we'll move away from sort of taking a whole a look at an entire disease and, and attacking it, but we're going to look at certain specific molecular uh, changes and attacking those with specific uh, therapeutic treatments. Uh, Bruce is uh, on the board of Continua, and I don't know as much about Continua as he does, but I, I do know what their mission here is, and you can see they've got, you know, some big, big players in this. Uh, Intel uh, has driven a lot of this, and, and uh, IBM and some others. Basically, <clears throat> what they're trying to do is create a standard architecture for interconnectivity of devices outside traditional healthcare settings. So think about, uh, you know, if your insurance company gets on board with this and says, you know, if you make specific lifestyle choices, we'll reduce your payments. So if you get on the treadmill and run, you know, 10 miles a week, and we've got a little device that's hooked on there that reports back to your, your medical home that you've done that, well, we can monitor that you've made that, that lifestyle choice and we'll reduce your payment. Uh, when I first heard of that, I thought, hey, you know, great revenue opportunity for college students. Hey, can you come over and run on my treadmill for half an hour? Uh, <laughs> but maybe there's a more sophisticated way to make sure it's the right patient. <clears throat> so uh, as we see, you know, they're really trying to, to create a, a communication layer and an integration layer from devices. Uh, so they'll, they'll create standards with all those companies, you know, the cell phone companies and the, and the processor companies and, and uh, a lot of the folks that create uh, the, the end user product and then it'll be able to connect through continua built uh, standards and they'll have a certification program for that. <clears throat> I'm not sure exactly how far this uh, proof of concept has gone, uh, but they're doing some things with uh, obesity and diabetes. You guys probably know this, but the chronic diseases are really the largest portion of healthcare costs. Um, and so anything you can do to sort of reduce the cost of chronic diseases, which have a huge lifestyle uh, impact, you know, what, what, you, what choices you make in your lifestyles have a huge impact on your, on your patient outcomes and how much money is spent on your healthcare. So they're trying to drive down that cost by doing some home monitoring of, of those choices that you make and being able to intercede when, you know, a patient's starting to decline. So that's, that's the, the detail I had here uh, for today. Basically, you know, we're seeing a huge amount of change as a result of healthcare IT. It's, it's kind of 10 or 15 years um, overdue. And, and, and I think a lot of it's being driven by this payment reform. So it's always been a good idea to take better care of patients, but only till recently were the financial incentives aligned for that, honestly. You know, if you, if you did a bad job on somebody and they stayed two weeks in the hospital versus three days, it was more revenue for you. Doesn't make sense, right? But that's the way it was. And now we're starting to change that. We're starting to pay you based on value. And that's going to have a huge change on the way doctors uh, take care of patients and all the information required to know, are we doing it the right way? Are we benchmarked appropriately? Uh, and can we and, and identify issues before the patient starts to go downhill, which requires you know, all kinds of monitoring and analytics and comparative effect in the studies and things like that. So I'm, I feel free to ask questions, and I'll, I'll try to answer uh, as best I can. Yes. <laughs> Susan? Yes, that's what you yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, it will be available um, uh, on the uh, Yes. I think, right. Right. Yeah, the, that's a good question. And I think probably the way I would answer that is that the way we think about getting care will change. All right. So, our, our method of, you know, being sick or having a condition and going to see our doctor, I think there'll be less and less of that in the future. And there'll be other opportunities for getting care, you know, via the internet, via...